What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the PFN Scouting Podcast. I'm Ian Cummings with my good friend and co-host, NFL Draft and Fantasy Analyst Derek Tate, otherwise known as The Tater. We are back today. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking more about post-2024 NFL Draft analysis, so most improved units, best wide receiver trios from the event, a lot of other content like that. So if you want to go back and check that out, feel free to do it. We also talked a little bit about our process as we transition from the 2024 cycle to 2025, but today... We've been teasing it for a long time. We've been building the anticipation. We are finally getting into 2025 NFL draft prospects. And what better way to start than talking about the quarterbacks? So we're going to get into all that QB analysis, what we've seen off our initial viewings. First off, though, I got to ask about my friend's well-being. Derek Tate, how are you doing this week? Oh, I'm fantastic. You know, it's never too early to pull out the binoculars and look ahead, maybe try to have a crystal ball so we can start taking a look at, you know, some of the big names that may be in the first round conversation for the upcoming 2025 NFL draft. It's never too soon, Ian. So I'm doing quite fantastic. I, I say, still need a haircut. I can, I'm I can right. feel the excitement bristling there. I can feel it. I can feel it. It's it's uh, it's in the air. Uh, it's one of those things where once you get into it, you really can't get out. I've, I've graded, I think, over 20 quarterbacks now. So uh, the preliminary viewings are, are well improved progress and uh, it's been really exciting i think last year we were kind of spoiled you've got well i mean both the past two years honestly cj stroud bryce young was a pretty good prospect regardless of the size anthony richardson had all the tools and then this past year caleb williams you got uh, drake may Jaden daniels jj mccarthy six quarterbacks going around one like that's just absurd right so that amount of volume at the top pretty hard to match and and so far i think the prevailing opinion has been that the 2025 nfl draft qb class will be a slight step down Right. But we don't know what's going to happen. There's still a full season of football left to play. So all we can do is get our initial valuations and our our initial viewings and kind of see what happens. So I I apologize because I know I I pulled you away from your fantasy duties a little bit to do some extra film watching. But I appreciate you uh, taking that time out. We're going to get into it right here. So I guess first off, Derek, initial impressions. Right. I mean, it's kind of one of those classes where. I feel like the depth of it gets undersold a little bit, right? I think we know that there is a relative dearth of top end guaranteed first round talent, right? I personally only have one QB in the first round range right now as from a raw grade. There's a few guys who can work into that uh, spot, but I only have one who's in the round one conversation actually above an 8.5 on my scale. But beyond that, there's like many quarterbacks. I think I'm, I'm looking at right now a well over a dozen that graded in the draftable range, at least for me. So I think the depth, the experience is definitely there. It's just who is going to be the one to rise from that muddled middle of the pack group. We don't quite know. But my first impression is I think there's a lot of potential energy here, right? Less certainty than last year. Absolutely. But the potential energy is there. Oh, uh, watching some of these young second callers absolutely makes me feel like, you know, two or three of these guys can work their way into day one draft capital, um, depending on what they put on on the fi- on film in 2024. So you're probably talking about Carson Beck is the one guy that probably graded out that right, mine, as yeah. a you know, bona fide, you know, day one prospect heading into the 2025 NFL draft. And, and I'm with you. I think that he is a first round talent. I've also got Shadur Sanders in that round one range. There's a lot of things that I really enjoy about his game that we can kind of talk about a little bit more nuanced here as we progress this conversation. But, you know, other really intriguing dual threat options like I like Jackson Dart's game. Jalen Daniels also really stood out to me. Jalen Moreau's got all kinds of physical tools mm-hmm. out the wazoo. So, I mean, there are some some young signal callers that flash some of that elite upside that I think a lot of today's NFL you know, personnel and uh, offensive schematics, you know, with how many RPO concepts there are, you know, kind of, you know, integrating across the league. There's a lot of conversation to have about some of these young prospects that have plenty of athleticism to to threaten an opposing defense with their legs in addition to what they have uh, to produce th- with their arm through the air. So I, I think that there could be, you know, somewhere around three or four or five guys that could eventually maybe enter that day one conversation, depending on how they perform on the field in 2024. Yeah, it's definitely a potential energy. There, there's something to be said about the, the time and the reps that we have left to undergo here, but there is a lot of potential. I think people shrug it off like, you know, the grass isn't always greener, right? 
And right now on the surface, it looks like we're not going to see, see quite as much first round output as we did in 2024, right? You know, that was kind of an anomaly. That was the first time that six QBs have ever gone around one. And I think it was a perfect storm of talent and team need as well. A lot of teams needed yeah. quarterbacks. So that would kind of drove it forward. But there is still that talent to grow from. Like you said, let's start at the top of the board because uh, Carson Beck is my QB one. You said Shadur Sanders is your QB one. Carson Beck and Shadur Sanders both had some of the most hype coming into the class. They were the most established guys, the most established names. And for me, what separated Carson Beck, he's got an 8.5025 on my scale. So just in the first round range. And but that's a decent interval ahead of the next best guy for me. And I think what separated Carson Beck for me, just the level of down to down consistency. You know, uh, one, one I, I think he has the best consistency from a down to down. Like, you know what to expect. You know, he knows how to navigate the pocket. He's very accurate. I think the situational precision, the aerial accuracy to always give his guy a chance. But then the elite, the, the high level, I don't know if it's quantifiably elite, but it's close to it. The arm talent, right? The layering ability, the velocity where he can drive the ball into really tight windows while also arcing and lofting it enough to get it over defenders, right? Not just drive balls. He knows how to vary right. that. And I think that's a very good trait to have, especially a guy who's a pretty nimble pocket operator i don't think he's an elite athlete i think that's where some of the other guys separated from him i think beck has decent speed when he gets out in space but again he's not going to be a guy who makes his living evading defenders and creating for himself he's the pocket passer the quintessential pocket operator who i think has the tools to carve up defenses from the pocket because he's nimble he can navigate manage spacing he can anticipate windows very good processor very accurate i just think a lot of the operational categories that i grade he graded pretty highly for me and i think if he if he leaps into the elite range in one or two of those he can easily work into early to mid first round conversation and be a top five pick so i think for me carson beck is just that guy you know i wanted to like Shadur sanders in the same realm but i see the consistency in the pocket as a pocket operator i think the processing the independent processing is a little bit more at a higher level right now and he has the arm talent to capitalize on that so those are the tools that really stood out to me with him. But Shadur Sanders, I can see the appeal for him. I think the accuracy is very appealing when he's able to loft it. I think when he's able to stay comfortable. I know there have been some comparisons to Geno Smith with the body type, the accuracy, the touch, right? Things like that. I don't think he's quite the athlete that Smith was. But again, I can see the tail. What gave Sanders the QB1 nod for you? See, I, and you mentioned how Harrison Beck, or excuse me, Carson Beck. <laughs> I'm getting all kinds of different names <laughs> incorrectly here uh, recently on the scouting podcast. Whoop de doo. Um, but when it comes to Carson Beck, there's certainly something to be said about how you feel comfortable with him being able to kind of go through his reads and pocket manipulation. It just feels like he's operating from a clean pocket far more often than Shador Sanders was. And for me, when Sanders has the opportunity to operate from a clean pocket, you know, there's a lot to like. And I think the ball comes out of his hands quickly. He looks decisive. He looks in control of the offense. He actually looked in control of the offense despite playing with a new, I mean, obviously he was, you know, playing with a new program, but a new offensive coordinator in his first game against TCU and went bonkers to start the year. And of course that, that snap to snap consistency, that is where you can probably give the nod to Beck a little bit. So I understand why you're higher on Beck, but I just, I, I, I love the functional athleticism that I have, that I see from Sanders. He extends plays. He keeps his eyes down the field. Um, there is some anticipation with his game as well that I really like. It seems to understand the pre-snap processing um process quite that well. That was one I thing said that really stood out with me is the pre-snap autonomy and the play, re the, the recognition, right? Where he can recognize opportunities in the defense, whether they're in single high, right? All right, audible, get my guy up up the seam on a, on a slot vertical, right? And just let him feast on that space. He's definitely shown that he can make those pre-snap adjustments and capitalize on it. I think that autonomy is very, very promising. And you mentioned it too, Georgia, Colorado, you're kind of working at opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to offensive line play. Georgia, you know, had, had Amarius Williams go round one. They've got, um, uh, Ernest Green, who's another prospect in this year's class. They had Cedric Van Pran, Tate Ratledge, Xavier Trust. They got a really good line up front. They always have. And I think that Carson Beck definitely thrives and flourishes with that. I do think some of the, the offensive line inconsistencies at Colorado kind of ironed in some bad habits for Sanders, like drifting back in the pocket. And, and you want to, you hope that he gets better play this year so that he can fix that, right? Because sometimes the situation does create those bad habits for guys. So I want to see if he can correct that. But at the same time, as an evaluator, you understand it's, it's not all on him. It's the, the situation has had an effect there. 
So, I mean, another thing that I really liked about Sanders game too. So when you did keep him clean, I thought that he was very efficient and effective uh, operating within the structure of an offense. Mm -hmm. But I also, even though that there were some bad habits that, like you said, kind of popped up when he would face pressure or, you know, when the offensive line of Colorado was just outmatched against their opponent, which did happen, you know, frequently uh, in 2023. I also liked Sanders' decision-making because he really didn't put the ball in harm's way very often last year, despite a lot of that offense uh, being driven through him being able to manufacture, you know, yards and extend drives and make plays with his arm. I mean, and, and we're talking about the, I mean, I know that Travis Hunter is an, outstanding athlete and prospect. And certainly there's a very nuanced conversation to have when it comes to him being a two way, you know, star, but you know, it was like what Xavier Weaver was yeah. their only draftable receiver coming from that Colorado offense this year. Whereas, you know, we, we saw with Georgia, we saw Vlad McConkey at the uh, top of the second round. We saw Brock Bowers, you know, and then you mentioned all the offensive line talent, um, you know, coming from Georgia, you know, with Mims even being selected in the first round. So the talent is something that, and I don't want to hold that against Beck because Beck is still performing at a very high level. He's running the offense. It's clearly very productive. And there are a lot of things that I really like. That's why he's my QB too. It's just, if I were to put, I would, I feel as if I were to put Sanders in that Georgia offense and put Beck in that Colorado offense, you know, and I'm not saying that that's always the best way to compare prospects, but that is something that if I, if I were to put those swap positions with those two, would I feel that Sanders would be just as effective or efficient in that Georgia offense as Beck would be in Colorado? You know, it, it's certainly a conversation to be had. There's just a lot of moxie and and leadership qualities that I really like from Sanders on top of his ability to be able to operate within the structure of an offense. Yeah, for sure. And it's one of those things where, you know, it's a thought that crosses the mind, right? You know, it's impossible to ignore. Like, what if he was in a different situation? What right. if they flipped? Like, <laughs> hey, what would happen? You know, that's what we do as humans, right? We, we, we think about those theoreticals. And, you know, Sanders' leadership is one of those things where I know a lot of people made a big deal about the social media stuff, right? Like kind of dissing transfers who are leaving and stuff like that. There's a lot of a lot of controversy surrounding that. And it's, it's one of those things where you can't really ignore it. How do I feel about it personally? I, you know, half and half. I know we, we can't understand the full character palette for any prospect. Right. We just don't have that intricate knowledge. And I do think that, you know, he has proven that he's the leader of the offense. He can keep them on schedule. Like you said, I think keeping the ball out of harm's way is a really important thing, you know, where the, the fumbling is kind of an issue at times when he's taking sacks, which I mean, the offensive line could be, a, you know, a counterproductive for that, too. But there were also times where Sanders was drifting away and maybe it can improve ball handling. So, you know, you want him to keep ironing out that. But I I was looking at some stats here and I think four, 430 attempts last year, only three interceptions, right? So that's below 1%. That's pretty impressive, right? And with the amount of volume that he was tasked with commanding in that passing passing attack, to have that low of a number, you can't scoff at that. That's impressive. You know, that's, that's impressive. And I think that's translatable too. So, you know, I think... On the leadership side, there's some pros and cons, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hold it against them because, you know, they're all young. They're all maturing. Right. You know, let's see what they can do there. And, you know, Deion Sanders was at the NFL level. He knows what he's doing. So it's one of those things. It's wait and see for me. But I, I'm really intrigued. And to the listeners out there, I told Derek to, to come in cold here. I, he didn't know my list ahead of time. So Sanders is actually my QB four. So I've got two guys in that okay. two to three spots ahead. I'm going to try. Can you guess the two? Ooh, uh, I kind of feel like you may be a Jackson Dart yes, guy. Yep, that's my that's my QB three. <laughs> that's my QB three. You got it. Jalen Daniels? Oh, no, no. Jalen Daniels is my QB six. Okay. So I'll, I'll okay. reveal I'll okay. reveal my QB two later. But let's talk about Jackson Dart because you had him as your you had him in your top five. I was talking to you before the pod, and I think you had him in yeah. your top five. QB four. QB four. Yeah. QB4. So Jackson Dart, I like him a lot. I think um the athleticism is definitely there, which is you know kind of surprising because again he's a guy with a lot of volume as a passer in that old mess offense but then you look at him i think accelerate explode up field right like he's got legit mm -hmm. speed when he can attack those seams so it kind of caught me off guard and like this guy's got wheels for sure but then you look at him in the pocket and i think for me the the passing profile that he has with the high level arm talent again he's got a baseball background you can tell with the arm elasticity the angle freedom he's got really good velocity yep. generation i think he's pretty mechanically sound too you know there are a few minor release notes that i made but overall i think this is a guy who can employ synergetic technique he's shown that he can stay in phase navigating the pocket 
can be a little better. I think, you know, sensing pressure and not drifting into lanes. But overall, I was looking at this guy and I'm thinking like, all right, he can anticipate over the middle. He can anticipate windows. He can throw guys open with that arm talent. He's athletic. He's tough. You know, what are we missing here? Right. Because I and I think sometimes on drive balls, there are times where his situational precision can improve, too. So little things like that, kind of more, more fine tuning than overhauls. But I came away from darts evaluation thinking, you know, this guy's got all the requisite talent. And he's well on his way on the operational side. So I think round one is definitely on the table for him. Again, a few things to fix, mainly the pocket management. That was the biggest note for me. But I'm looking at this guy as a first round upside kind of guy. And I think QB3 Mm -hmm. for me, what impressed you with Jackson Dart? Because obviously a guy who came from USC, he was a highly touted recruit. I think he was Mr. Football in, in the state of Utah. I think he broke some high school records as a Utah quarterback. And you know now he's been making his making his way at Ole Miss and really producing. So what stood out for, for you for Dart? Certainly the arm talent, uh, the arm talent, you know, being able to throw off platform, whether he's kind of fading off or when he's got his mechanics lined up, whew, that ball shoots out of his hand. But, you know, he's also capable of making off platform throws and, you know, even on the run, like you said, it kind of shows up in his baseball background because he's fully comfortable just letting it rip um, when he's operating outside the pocket. Now, like you said, there's some nuances that, I want to see a little bit more poise when trying to navigate and sift through traffic in the pocket. Um, And, and, you know, so his mechanics don't unwind, even though he can just rely on his arm talent. I would like to see it a little bit more consistent and cleaned up. Um, You know, there's always some questions that I have about, you know, quarterbacks coming from Ole Miss in that Lane Kiffin offense too. a lot of RPOs uh, that kind of stood out to me. And there's certainly some anticipation over the middle of the football field, which was really nice and really encouraging to see because that's something I value heavily because you know unless you're Russell Wilson or Kyler Murray who can just pepper the ball outside the numbers or deep down the football field you really want to have a quarterback that feels comfortable operating and exposing the intermediate portion of the football field which Jackson Dart flashed last season he kept Spencer Sanders off the football field by the Mm way that, it's not a, that Spencer Sanders is not a bad football player whatsoever. So the fact that Jackson Dart was able to beat him out and win that quarterback competition uh, and and showcase what the reason why certainly is very encouraging. And I certainly there are some throws that he made outside the numbers on the third level of the football field that just made me go, Whoo, yeah. And then his athleticism, like you said, that surprised yeah. me. Like he's running away from people. Um, Look, and there's my first impression was that this is a guy with arm talent, right? You know, that was something that really stood out immediately. And in a guy who's got a lot of volume as a passer, but like you said, you, you watch him take off and, you know, there were some design running plays like QB draws, read options where, like this guy's reaching like probably almost 20 miles an hour and he's you know he's shooting down the seam like what are we what are we doing here like it really catches you off guard but i think there is legitimate appeal and and kind of merit to using him as a not a not an elite design running threat but i think a guy who can provide value there at least in that phase a little bit absolutely so no you know him as my quarterback for it's certainly i see the tools and i see the flashes of processing to be able to operate an NFL offense, potentially. Uh, I mean, I'm very excited to see what he what he uh, can do. And that's why I was kind of mentioning there's about five quarterbacks that I could see um, jumping into that day one discussion. And he is certainly one of those prospects. So Jackson Dart, you know, being at quarterback four behind, you know, Sanders. Uh, and I haven't revealed my quarterback three yet, but I've also got, you know, uh, Carson Beck in front of him. But you know, he's certainly in that that conversation for a guy that I see having round one upside, uh, you know, depending on how his 2024 campaign plays yeah, out. Yeah, and the Ole Miss note is, is notable, too, because Matt Corral obviously was a was a very polarizing yeah. evaluation. And I think looking back at that class, I think the scarcity of that QB group maybe forced people to get more excited about guys. Right. Like, I think we had the Malik Willis conversation a couple of podcasts ago where he's got the tools. Yeah. Maybe let's invest in this guy. But then you watch the tape and operationally, there's there's a lot to work on right i think matt corral was a similar one in the sense that you saw the athleticism you saw the really live arm but i think he was a little more reliant on those rpo looks and those quick game rhythm game throws much more reliant than jackson dart in my opinion i look at darts tape and yes you do still see that you know it's a staple of the kiffin offense it is right so there's gonna be a little bit of that but you know things that i look for right anticipation over the middle of the field throwing guys open uh you know when do they trigger are you triggering when the guy's already open or when he's crossing behind a defender because if you're crossing behind defender that shows me some comfort with the scheme 
the coverage that you're looking at and, and knowing where to throw it ahead of time, right? The timing orientation is so important, but then also reading high to low, right? Going through progressions quickly, working to your landmarks and your check down. I think he's shown that too. So I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about Dart. In I know, you know, it's very easy, especially with quarterbacks, to look at the helmet and think Matt Corral had these major flaws. Maybe Dart's going to have him too, right? But to me personally, and I think you will agree, Dart looks a little more promising on that end. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So who is your QB3 then? We'll do the big reveal and then I'll do my QB2. But who's your QB3? Drew Allen. Okay, I like it. Uh, from Penn State. And look, I know he had a disappointing 2023 season as a whole. But when I'm taking a, a like a closer look at some of the positive reps that I saw from him last year, and I didn't think that there was all that – much talent as far as, you know, NFL future prospects that he's thrown the football to. No offense to the Penn State receivers. I hope they get better. Um, but certainly it feels as if maybe the play calling, too, was not always putting Aller in the best position to succeed. But, Ian, I got to tell you, when it comes to his post, pre and post snap processing, he's right there. As far as I think maybe the best in this class, I think his ability to be able to get through multiple reads and get to his backside option consistently. I think Aller is potentially the, the best in this class from what I've seen so far. And you, I love his, his base. Like he is able to stay, uh, keep his, you know, his shoulders and his feet and his hips all tied together generates a lot of torque. I mean, there was one rep against Michigan State where he goes, you know, play action under center, which is also another thing that the Penn State offense happens to have a lot of that. A lot of these other prospects don't have uh, operating these kind of, you know, unique college spread air raidy type schemes. He's operating under center off play action turning his back to the defense and at the top of his drop against Michigan stadium corked a 60 yard bomb <laughs> that fell right in the bucket on a post route. It, it's, and I'm not just saying I want to take their one highlight because Jalen Mil Milrose got play uh, plenty of yeah. that uh, in his Alabama tape, but his ability to be able to get through multiple reads uh, ball placement was another thing that I really liked that kind of speaks to his mechanics, uh, his processing one, two, three, his eyes. And I see eye manipulation, too, which is another thing that I don't always see from a lot of these college quarterbacks who are, you know, in these wonky systems where they're kind of, you know, operating off their primary read or like we already mentioned, you know, an RPO heavy scheme mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of making it's it's simplifying the you know, read and processing part of it uh, to get easy completions, which is fine. That's their, you know, the coach's job to be able to get the offense, you know, on task and uh, ahead of the sticks. But there's a lot of things that Drew Aller does when it comes to throwing with anticipation, accuracy on all three levels of the football field, uh, operating within the confines of an offense and the mechanics that I really like. And, you know, certainly some very nice arm strength uh, and arm velocity mm -hmm. that I think translates very well. I just really wish that he was in a in a had a few more playmakers in that Penn State offense to kind of help elevate his game. I was yeah, I was very surprised. Like, I think the first like five things you mentioned, none of them were arm strength. The guy's got a rocket. The guy's got a bazooka on his right shoulder. And the fact that, you know, the first five things that you mentioned were not that kind of speaks to what he already has working for him. This guy was going to be, if he declares, he'll just be a 21 year old rookie. I think he, he'll still be very young. Right. He's only a, a junior or redshirt sophomore. He's a third year player, um, former five star recruit. So definitely has the physical talent for sure. The rocket arm, man. He's got, but the, he's got the arm elasticity and the angle freedom too. Like you said, to layer passes really tightly. Um, I really like the anticipation, the break anticipation that I saw. There were a few reps where you know they've got a intermediate hitch comeback route in the slot, and he's hitting that guy right in the torso, right as he turns around with with immense velocity. Just really impressive reps like that. And I think that you know showing that processing ability, that processing capacity as such a young player is really appealing to me. There were a few things, I think as a young quarterback, I think, you know, mechanically, there is a degree of feel when he's in phase. I think he's a very natural thrower in phase. For me, the drop back and step up footwork uh, can still improve. I think there's times where, you know, when he is redirecting back and forth, forward and backward, there are times where he can get tied up a little bit. I think there are times when if he's encountering pressure, looping around, that can impact his synergy and mechanics and that can create, uh, that can cause bouts of inaccuracy too. So I think the biggest things for me, the drop back footwork, the sequencing, 
um, and the accuracy issues that come along with that. But when he is in phase, like you said, that's when he can make some really, really impressive throws. And he's already pretty promising for his age with pre-snap and post-snap processing. So I think all of the building blocks that you want are there with him. Is he a Josh Allen type of athlete at his size? I don't I don't no. think he's quite there, right? I think he's mobile enough. Mm-hmm. I think he can go off platform, off script. I don't think he's that kind of athlete. Definitely not a Josh Allen or a Drake May, but a guy who I think within the pocket, there is a lot to like. There's a lot to be excited about. So there was one anticipation throw that I want to mention real quick. Uh, it was his, his hands already separated to throw the football when – a defender, I think it was a, a safety, was trying to carry a seam up the slot, and the defender's back was turned to the to the quarterback, you know, and and that was something that Aller read perfectly and threw back shoulder. Because I mean, when you're when you're looking and you see the defender's back is turned, the only thing that the defender is really covering is the width of his shoulders because yeah. he can't see the ball. So he put it back shoulder, you know, for a score. It, it, the separation. The, the the receiver wasn't even past the the defender yet, and the ball was all. Aller already decided to throw the ball back shoulder, so that shows me anticipation. That is something that's very exciting, and I think definitely translates to the NFL. And not just anticipation, but situational awareness too. You know, knowing you know what is the defender giving me? Does he have his eyes toward me or toward the receiver? And how can I exploit that? Right, that's a a level of situational reasoning that you really want to see from young QBs in the heat of the moment. I think Al has shown that. Another impressive thing too. I think twenty five touchdowns, just two interceptions. Right, so you know the the right. accuracy can definitely improve, but I think his discretion, his decision making, is overall pretty good. You know, he was one of those guys. I watched the Ohio State game live last year, and that was a rough one for the entire Penn State offense. Yeah, it was not it fun. Was not, it was not fun. And I think looking back, right, looking back, because it's midway through the season, we're focused on the 2024 NFL draft. I think that left a sour taste in my mouth where I'm thinking to myself, yeah, Drew Aller needs some more time, maybe two more years, right? But I was watching him back this summer, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, I really undersold the amount that's already there. There's still things to work on, but there is something there already. I am going to re- re- reveal uh, – I can't speak either, man. It's one of those things. <laughs> my goodness, it's too early for this, man. Um, I'm going to reveal my, my QB2 in a little bit. But before we move on to that, I, I just want to talk about one more guy who's kind of in the similar bucket of Drew Aller, and that's Connor Wagman from Texas a and This is a guy yeah. who I, I was bringing him up to you. It was like pretty similar conversation in the sense that they're both really young. They're both former five-star recruits. So the talent is obviously there. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know if you got to watch as much of him, so we can go through this quick. Quickly, but for me, Connor Wagman is another guy to keep an eye on. At the very least, he was one of those guys who I think he started four games in 2022, was going to be the full-time starter in uh, 2023, but suffered an injury uh, four games in and missed the rest of the year. So really, really small sample size to work with. But I will say within the sample size we have, he definitely another guy to keep on the first round radar if he can get more reps. I kind of... He kind of feels like a more athletic Jared Goff to me, right? Kind of a similar body type, a little high hipped, but he's okay. he's definitely mobile. He can get out in space. He can throw off platform and he can throw with pace. He's got really good drive velocity when he's loaded up and he's also got good touch. And, and I think the ability to add loft on his throws and use that arm elasticity, again, that baseball background, we see that every now and then when guys have that baseball background, their arms are usually a little bit looser, a little more elastic, a little bit more free flowing with their angles and release points. And Connor Wagman definitely has that too so i think you know a lot of the young qb things that you want to see him improve on right definitely processing i think drew hour is a better processor right now when it comes to reading and anticipating and i I do think that wagman can still improve his pocket management and depth discipline a little bit but the arm talent is there i think the athleticism is there the toughness is there and the the flashes of situational accuracy and precision are elite so there's definitely something to work with what did you see from him with what you were able to watch the only so we have very you know kind of a very small sample size to work with uh and i think that the processing that can come with reps yeah. right you're talking to maybe he's not quite on aller's level quite yet that's okay i, I mean, was gonna full season you know, yeah right exactly so um and very very young I, certainly i see all the the tools that you see i just want to i really wish that you know, sometimes it feels like he comes up a little bit short when trying to feather touches over the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and his receivers made some really nice plays on some of his like, you know, touchdown, um, touchdown passes. I, it's almost like he's, you know, not putting enough club into it. It's almost like he's a little nervous to out- overthrow his guys. Mm-hmm. Like he should be pulling out the eight iron instead of, instead of a nine iron, just a little bit more. Uh, and I think that you know, you got a lot of physical tools to work there uh, with, with Weinman. So I, I'm certainly 
on the same wavelength as you. I, I see the upside. Um, he's actually my quarterback six, but you know, it, it, I just need to see a little bit more to feel aggressively moving him up my rankings. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's interesting with which he, with each young QB, you have different, you know, pre-existing connotations to work with. Like JJ McCarthy had a full season to work with when he was heading in last cycle. So we had a better idea that he would probably crack round one as long as he, you know, kept playing well, kept producing, kept leading his team to wins. And look, look at what happened. He was a top 10 pick. So, you know, usually when you have more to work with, it makes it a little easier with Wagman only eight starts you got to improve this. You got to increase the sample size, right? There's a lot to like from what we've seen, but naturally I think there's just more experience needed. So my, he's my QB seven. I think I got Jalen Daniels QB six. So we can talk about more of those guys with time we have left, but I'm going to reveal my QB two. Uh, you ready for this, Derek? Let's do it. My QB two preliminary QB two. This cycle is Donovan Smith out of Houston. That was my QB two. I was like, I I had a feeling you're going to be surprised about that. So, Okay. The tools are there. 6'5", 235. I was coming in this evaluation, and I think he had 22 touchdowns, 13 interceptions this past year. So a little bit higher on the turnover output. I was thinking, you know, it, you never want to come into an evaluation with expectations, right? Because that can kind of dictate what you see. So you want to have a fresh palette. And I was trying my best to do that. But naturally, you're a human being, right? You're going to have some thoughts going through your head. So my, my initial thoughts were probably got the talent. Decision making could probably will probably be an issue, right? I was watching his tape, man. I came away much more impressed with the operational framework than I expected to be. I was and I, I was expecting, you know, a functional floor. But, you know, especially that game against Texas, man, you know, he was giving them a fighting chance the entire time. This is a guy who can navigate the pocket very well when you're talking about sensing both interior and ancillary pressure outside. Very good pocket navigator, very good with spatial reasoning. But he can get off platform as well. I think for his size, extremely flexible athlete, extremely flexible runner. And he can throw off platform. He's got that arm elasticity, not only to throw and generate velocity off platform, but also layer pace and touch and really attuned to situational precision on throws. Some of his vertical passes where he's not just driving it downfield. He's throwing to the back shoulder. He's throwing away from the defender, throwing his guy open, adding loft and touch on it and getting it to the high point. Right. You know, really good understanding, just spatial reasoning and understanding both in the pocket and down the field so those things were very impressive to me but then he's a legit athlete too i mean you can use him as a runner if you want he's got speed he's got agility for his size was really impressed by that the toughness and then also i think the anticipation is legitimate with him i think there are times there were a few times where an interception a turnover worthy throw was more a result of a miscommunication between him and the receiver than it was him. you know there were a few times where yes he's got the arm arrogance sometimes he'll try and force passes a few plays where he'll just miss a a linebacker looming in the flat right which you need to improve that but sometimes young qbs have that issue right so i'm not going to bury him for it but you know there were times where he's actively trying to anticipate he's multitasking in the pocket with pocket management and processing field vision field um you know, I'm trying to think of the word, but processing, just general reads and progressions, stuff like that. You know, sure. it's, it's a very important skill to have to multitask with your pocket management and your progressions from read to read, you know, making sure that you stay in sync on schedule. And Donovan Smith, to me, definitely has that. I think there's still things to work on. Right. I think that the um, the processing can still get a little more consistent from down to down. Right. I do think there are times when the decision making does you know, affect him, right? Where sometimes he'll try and force an ill-advised throw. But more often than not, I was left really impressed with not only the physical tools that are there, but also the level of processing and reasoning skills and spatial IQ that you're working with. And I definitely think there's something there. So he's my QB too. I love the, you know, the idea of the elastic thrower, an athlete who has that high level uh, potential as a processor and pocket operator. And he's got that creation ability too. So one of my guys where definitely banking on the upside a little bit, and he's going to be a little older. I think He's going to be a 23-year-old rookie, maybe turn 24. So, you know, he's been around a little bit. He started at Texas Tech and then transferred to Houston. But right. last year was really, I, I think it was promising. I think we overlook the tools that are there. And I do think he has the skills to potentially enter the round one conversation if he can cut down on the bad decisions. There's there's, there's definitely things to like. I mean, as far as the tools and flashes um, of anticipation, that I, I that I, I do value and, and I do think are there 
occasionally. But the getting through his progressions, uh, you know, even in that Texas game, there were a couple times where I thought that he stayed play side or primary side a, a bit too a bit too long. Uh, I'd like to see him get through his reads a little bit quicker. Um, you know, I, I did see some good decision making, even some good throwaways. Like so, I mean, there the, the mental process of it is there. And even I saw, you know, watching some of his Texas Tech tape in 2022, I saw some of it as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to like. It's just that, you know, the interception total is one that makes me raise an eyebrow because of the decision making. I want to see the, that cleaned up and a bit more consistent. Um, certainly, I understand that he's trying to carry that Houston offense. And, and, you know, when you're trying to make plays and you're putting the ball in harm's way, it's going to happen sometimes. And maybe you, you even alleviated to some of the miscommunications between him and his uh, receivers. So that also plays a factor. Um, that's also something where, you know, the transfer portal kind of creates this, you know, lack of chemistry yeah. <laughs> when players are going from team to team and system to system. Um, but I do think that Donovan Smith, I, you have him all the way at QB two. I mean, obviously I, I have not of my top five, so I'm, I, I have some more like the ball placement. Um, I see some ball play, placement issues, uh, ones that are not, he, sometimes he's putting it within the catch radius of a player, but not always maximizing yak mm -hmm. with precise ball placement. I, we see flashes of it, like you said, going back shoulder. Um, so it's there. I just want to see it more consistent. For sure. So that, that's where I guess that that's where I kind of feel with Donovan Smith. I just want to see the high end flashes just a bit more consistent. And then I feel more comfortable elevating an athlete that I think can contribute with his legs and threaten defenses, um, you know, in that capacity, moving him a, a little bit farther up my ranks. Yeah. And, um, I'm checking my grades here real quick. Yeah, I, the big one of the bigger accelerants for his uh, for his grade was the physical tools, right? Obviously, I think there's enough an operational framework to work with, and the pocket management in particular was very impressive to me. But he scored an eight for arm strength, so very good. A nine for arm elasticity for me because that angle freedom, that off platform ability, that layering potential was really impressive to me. And then an eight from creation capacity too, because he is a very live elastic athlete for his size. The explosion, the change of direction, the sink. The the evasive capacity. I think all of that is there with him. So, you know, the key thing, like you said, you know, is delivering on that potential because there are still a few areas where he can improve. But I came away very impressed with that overall combination. And he's one of those guys. Him and Dart are both more of a top 75 grade for me right now. Overall, they're not first round guys. Carson Beck's the only one in that, in that discussion for me. But um, there is potential with that group. So I'm very excited to see what they can do. We've got around We'll go with 15 minutes, 13 minutes. We always end up going over, Derek. I, you know, when, when, when Dalton was here, when Dalton was here, he's like, Ian, we got to we gotta stop for 45 minutes. We got to stop, man. But um, we're already getting more lenient there. So I apologize, Dalton. We, we tried as best as we could. We just talked too much. Um, so we've got a few more names to go through. One name I do sure. want to touch on, Quinn Ewers from Texas. I know he's had some, some hype as well, being a five-star recruit. Did you get a chance to watch him at all, get some thoughts on him? Because I was a little lower on him personally i just my my thoughts on him you know one i don't think he's that elite creative force to to kind of compensate for the deficiencies i see in the operational side right you know he weighed in i think under 200 pounds this past season i don't know how translatable that's going to be at the nfl level for durability and play strength and things like that and i you know there were times where the arm talent is definitely there i think he's got great arm strength he's another one who scored a nine above a nine for arm elasticity because it's the angle freedom with him is really second nature and it's very impressive the off-platform ability but there is an extreme even even still after two years of starting to me there's a pretty extreme lack of mechanical discipline, right? And yes. discipline. And that really, it's still pretty concerning for me because that can impact timing, pocket management, everything. And it can make the offense a lot less predictable, right? And if you're a quarterback, you, you will get Quinn Ewers and then Carson Beck, right? Carson Beck, always on time, always in rhythm, always very, very efficient with his movements. And that kind of maximizes, accentuates his raw talent and traits. With Quinn Ewers, sometimes it detracts from it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see if you can improve that, because right now it still feels like one of my notes on him in 2022 was that it felt like he was free flowing a lot. And that that led to issues of pocket navigation and spatial reasoning, but then also accuracy down the field. And I still think exactly. those issues come to light. So you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Everything you're saying, you're, you know, I, I might as well raise my hands up <laughs> and just you know say hallelujah, because there's <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. Um, 
one thing I, I feel like yours is a see it before I throw it type yeah. guy. And it's unfortunate, and, you know, it, maybe that wasn't the case. He was willing to give his playmakers on the outside a, a shot in contested catch situations when they were covered, um, you know, and he, he did flash that ability with that, you know, um, plus level arm strength and ability to push the ball down the field. It's not that the young man can't rip it with his arm. It's just, like you said, the mechanical consistency playing within the structure of the offense. There was a lot of people running wide open in this Steve Sarkeesian offense. And, you know, of course, when you have, you know, Jatavion Sanders who got drafted, uh, what was it on day two? You had Jonathan Brooks get drafted on day two. You had, uh, same thing with Adonai Mitchell. Oh, by the way, Xavier Worthy was around one yeah. pick. Like there was just so much talent on this offense and it's not that yours was terrible, but, I thought he left a lot of meat on the bone, Ian, when it came to his ball placement and his processing, that he left some just big plays out there that just didn't man like uh, manifest themselves because of Quinn Ewers. So I don't think the talent's going to get better, you know, than what we saw his past catchers were last year. So I, you know, as much as there is physical ability, I don't think he's going to be much of a dual threat playmaker on the next level. Cause you mentioned his size. And I just don't think that he's that twitchy, that explosive and, and, and directly comparing him to some of the top athletes, uh, dual threat prospects in this class. I, I think he's towards the bottom of the list. Um, and like you mentioned, sub 200 pounds, like, you know, He's, I don't see him breaking many tackles, if any, at the next level. So it's, um, if he's going to have to go strictly based off of what I've seen from him as a passer, I think he still has a long way to go. Can he get there? Potentially. But from what I saw, he's somebody I'm, I, I'm, I need to see a lot more consistency from in order to feel better about him, you know, maybe even sneaking into like the late day two conversation. I think he's probably going to be a day three. Pick. Yeah. And it's tough because, you know, you, the, the, I feel like there's a little bit of residual hype being a five star recruit. You know, people look and not just a five star recruit, but he was one of the most publicized guys out there in a long time. He was the number one overall recruit. He signed with Ohio State initially. Then he transferred to Texas and he was Steve Sarkeesian you know you know diamond signing right like this is the guy who's going to reform the program and uh they've done they've been competitive they, they've done very well but um right. you know, I, I still think it's a different discipline translating that to the nfl and i still think there is a lot to work on and there's not that elite physical combination to rely on you know like anthony richardson right you know not not an exact combination, right? Because I think Richardson did have a lot of things working in his favor on the operational side. But one reason people were so willing to bank on that is because that elite physical combination was there. I, I don't think I don't think Quinn Ewers is anywhere near that kind of point. So I, I, have, I have a day three grade on him as well. If he can improve the depth discipline and the mechanical discipline and the, the processing, right? Because I, I agree too. He's more of a see it, throw it guy. He's not not a high level anticipator. Um, very just a lot of a lot of components of his game are off schedule right now, and I don't know how translatable that is so if he can improve that i think day two is a possibility but um you know i'm still i'm a little hesitant there with the time we have left a couple more names that i, I definitely want to touch on and we can maybe touch on a couple more if we have more time but you've mentioned both of them uh the two jalen's jalen milrow and jalen daniels these two guys yeah. they feel like wild cards to me both of them and i'm very excited to see what they do but i want to start with milrow because we both were talking about him before the pod and the tools are just out of this world, right? And he's at Alabama, and they have Kalen DeBoer, who came from Washington now. And look at what Kalen DeBoer did for Michael Penix Jr. when he came over from Indiana, turned Michael Penix or helped turn Michael Penix Jr. into a top 10 pick going eighth overall to the Falcons. So, you know, he's proven that he can do work that kind of success with quarterbacks before, with very talented quarterbacks before. Alabama has the talent around him. Jalen Milrow, man, what do you think about this guy? Because my, my my prevailing my prevailing revelations were that very talented, still a lot of room for growth on the operational side, right? I think the throwing, the mechanics, I think the processing and the field vision is very hot and cold right now. But the, again, he's a hyper elite athlete. This dude is explosive. He's strong. He'll probably run a four four at like six two two twenty, right? So he's got all of those tools, and he's got a rocket arm too. He generates velocity with ease. He's got some off platform ability. I think a lot of good things to work with. But what does he need to work on? Give us a lowdown. I want to. I want to see him play within structure and get the ball out of his hands a little bit quicker, more consistently. Like you have it, you, the the processing portion of it is something where it's very inconsistent because yeah. there's there's times where he'll 
you know, make it all the way to the backside or uh, get off of his primary read pretty quickly and then, you know, throw a, a 45 yard dart or a 60 yard bomb <laughs> like like that. There's there's flashes of, of excellence as a passer. But it, I think that there's times where he he struggles a little bit to take a little bit off the fastball to layer his throws yeah. consistently. Like that's something where we, we know he's got a howitzer. It's just can he consistently, you know, with ball placement um, and that a lot of that has to do with you know, mechanics and operational side playing on time, because if you're not playing on time consistently, then you're trying to fit it into a tighter window um, or you're just getting off of that read completely and your mechanic and your timing timings all off. And that's the, the portion of it that concerns me a little bit uh, operating a high level passing attack can, he, but he's got courage. Uh, there is a lot to love about his like, cause there's times where he's staring down the barrel of the gun and, and he, doesn't matter. He, he's got the courage to just, you know, step fully into his throw, let it rip 50 yards down the field, takes a shot in the chest. And, you know, he's willing to do that because the man is a, a gamer in a lot of senses. I love his competitiveness. And certainly when he tucks the ball down and, and decides to become a ball carrier, my goodness, mm -hmm. he is impressive i mean there's a lot of bursts there's more like you mentioned michael Penix jr i think he's a far more has better hips as a ball carrier uh is not quite as linear as michael Penix and the burst and the power uh play strength contact balance like that's there for jalen milrow um there's so much to like but the processing of it is something that concerns me um sure it, the highlights are outstanding but the consistent snap over snap processing um and work the the willingness to work the middle of the field with the anticipation uh in the short to intermediate game is something that i want to see him be far more consistent with before because he's got the physical tools to be a day one pick it's just you know that processing element um is something that makes me a little bit nervous so he, he's an interesting study, man. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's fun. All the physical tools are there, like you said, the toughness. And I think the resolve is really going to, you know, win over NFL evaluators because this is not just a guy who shows that toughness on the field, but he was benched uh, for Tyler Buckner for one game last year, right? And that could have been the end of it, right? But then he came back in the next week and he played very well. And by the end of the season, he was probably Alabama's, one of their driving forces on offense for their success in Bless spite him. of his flaws as a passer. So you know that he's got that mental ability to really just stay in and withstand adversity and you know i think but at the same time too right like watching jermaine burton last year for example you could tell that there was a lot of meat left on the bone in that alabama all times because sometimes milrow just didn't quite see what he needed to see and you know sometimes take off and run too quickly so a lot to work on i think Penix jr looking back at his indiana film you could make a very strong argument that there were more flashes of processing ability and, and pocket awareness for Penix than there are for milrow right now that doesn't mean milrow can't get to that point but i think I think there's a bigger gap to traverse right now. So I got to watch tons of talent real quick. We've got around two and a half minutes. Jalen Daniels, my QB six right now, early day three for me, my really quick rundown athletic. He's I, I think he's got great arm talent, not an elite arm in terms of strength, but really good elasticity. And I think there is some really good anticipation work in, in bunches, right? You know, I think he's one of those guys who can operate as a, you know, as a distributor, as a ball handler in an offense, right? He's good on misdirections. He's a good running threat. And there is some passing upside there with the precision, the touch as well. What are your thoughts on Jalen Daniels? Can he be the wild card in this class? Yeah, he's a, he's definitely a wild card. It, it's weird that we have a, another you know quarterback that has I really think plus level athleticism. We had Jaden Daniels last year. We have Jalen Daniels yeah. this year from <laughs> from Kansas. Um, it's the again kind of the, the consistency with with, with uh, his certainly his mechanics. Um, he's really toesy, um, you know, which is something that I I I don't really like because i think it can mess with your ball placement and accuracy yeah. uh snap over snap can you get away with it sometimes in particular with a, a prospect like daniels who you already mentioned the arm elasticity and you know he's got plenty of arm talent uh even if it's not the most you know he's, he doesn't have michael vick type velocity but i mean it's certainly a, a very serviceable arm uh love his uh ability and, and feel as uh 
play extension creation uh, certainly can punish defenses and even even used as a plus level uh, you know threat uh, in the running game. So there's a lot to like with the physical tools. It's how consistently is he going to be able to operate an NFL offense? Um, that's something that I have some questions about. There's flashes of it, um, which makes me really intrigued about seeing how he develops and progresses as a passer um, heading into the 2024 college football season. Yeah, and can he stay healthy? That's the other thing, too, because he missed most of the year yeah, last year with a back injury. That's been an issue for him, just availability, and that can impact your ability to play at 100%, too. So that'll be something to watch. Also, a quick Easter egg as well. The offensive coordinator that Jalen Daniels was so successful with, Andy Kotelnicki, I think is his name, he is now at Penn State. So Drew Aller will get to work with him this year. So that will be a fun parallel to see if Aller can take the next step with a better offense. That is all the time we have for our initial 2025 NFL Draft quarterback preview. Any guys that we didn't mention or thoughts that you have on other QBs, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below and hit us up on Twitter. Uh, now X, formerly Twitter. I'm going to keep calling it Twitter. But um, <laughs> that's all we got for today. We're going to we're fully transitioned into the 2025 NFL Draft. So we are going to be, you know, maybe we'll take a few looks back every now and then at 2024 and we'll keep we'll keep up with the class and, and keep tabs on it. But 2025 is on the way and we are just now gearing up and getting into the swing of things. Thank you, as always, for listening. Peace out. Have a good one.